Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, my name is Ruth Almain. I'm a member of this congregation and also the COO. And I'm glad to have so many folks out tonight. And I just, quick introduction of Ryan and Carol LaHerd. Um, we did figure out that, that Carol probably met me when I was a baby. <laughs> And uh, but we, um, as a semi grown up and as a young teenager, I knew them because they came and worked with my dad in Western Pennsylvania. And so I've known them a long time. And as things started going even worse in October in the Middle East and in the Holy Land, and as I struggled myself about what to think, am I using the right names? Like, what's the difference between Hamas and Palestine and Israel and and just not really knowing? if I'm using the right names, if I'm going to offend people that I care about. And then I kind of thought, well, you know, Mr. Rogers said, like, look for the helpers, right? And so it's hard when you see that older generation pass on that you really relied on. And you were like, oh, they would have known. My dad would have known. These people would have, like, been able to kind of help me figure this out really quickly. And I suddenly remembered, you do have friends and I do have helpers. And so Ryan and Carol Hurd have been friends of my parents for a very long time. I've also uh, been grateful to know them and, again, remembered that they had personal experience, they had a lot of professional experience. I'll let them share more of those details. They live here in Chicago. We've seen each other. It's maybe been close to 50 years since we've seen each other until tonight. But so what a great opportunity, again, to say, please come help us. Please come help me and other people learn because we're worried, we're concerned, we want to know what to do, and I won't go on any longer. And please bear with us while we do a little bit of technical things here and there, but we want to make sure that, again, we'll have about 30 minutes of both Ryan and Carol presenting by PowerPoint, and then we'll come off the PowerPoint, and then we'll have discussion. For those of you out there in Zoom land, um, I'll be monitoring the chat so you can ask your questions, but it'll need to go in the chat. Um, and there's some information on the table over here, some of the articles that we posted before. Um, and please, at any point, too, just get up and help yourselves to treats. There's bathrooms right there if you need to know that, too. I'll trust all of you at home to know where that is. Um, and without further ado, again, uh, thanks again to Ryan and Carol Hurd for coming to talk with us tonight. Thank you so much, Ruth. And I want to just reiterate that I think Ruth's dad, Louis Almain, for those of you who haven't heard of him, um, became my friend and mentor when I entered Augustana College as a freshman in 1964. And he was my first biblical professor, and I ended up becoming a bi biblical professor myself. And then in 1977, we moved to Teal College in Western Pennsylvania, where Louis Almain was the president, and he hired my husband to be head of the English department. So we are really grateful to that family, and it's so fun to have Ruth back here and to show up. Well, I shouldn't say back here. You did you were lived in Illinois, but back now. So I want to just reiterate or say a little bit about my own connection to this. Can everybody hear me okay on Zoom? Thumbs up, sort of shaking heads, and you can hear me okay in the room? Okay, thanks. Um, besides um, Israel-Palestine, which has been a passion of ours, also interfaith relations has been one of my passions as an academic and as a volunteer in the ELCA. Um, and some of you may know that from 2006 to 2011, I coordinated the ELCA's Peace Not Walls program, trying to implement Middle East peace. Obviously, we did not succeed um, as hard as we tried. Um, and since then, I've been more or less a volunteer um, working with interfaith relations for the ELCA. Um, but I think I try to use those two realities to describe that both my denomination and apologies to those of you who don't know what ELCA is. I know maybe there's people out in Cyberland who aren't members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, but um, my denomination and I share a commitment to um, autonomy, peace, um, safety for both Israel and Palestine, as well as very strong, healthy Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Christian relations in this country. Here's what we're going to try to do tonight um, as quickly as we possibly can. First, I'll do a concise history of the whole region from 1914 to the present day. It'll be the fastest one summary you ever heard, I think. Uh, then Ryan will do some consideration of the terminology we often use. And then we're going to share the link to a 15-minute talk from our church administrator, who is a descendant of Palestinian immigrants to the United States. Um, at our church being Holy Trinity in Wrigleyville. Then um, we'll have some discussion, hear your questions, and be ready to think about some possible next steps. 
Um, and so I'm going to um, try to get the PowerPoint started. Let's see, I have to share screen. Okay. For 450 years, this region was under the control of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, and that empire shows up in green on this slide. That ended, came to the end, um, at the end of World War I, because the Muslim Turks were on the side, the losing side with the Germans, um, and their empire was broken up. They got to keep the part that's today Turkey, but Britain was given control over the region that would eventually become Israel, Jordan, Iraq, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia, and France was given control over Syria and Lebanon. Um, they were considered mandate powers, and the word mandate meant that they were caretakers um, until these fledgling um, countries that were carved out of the Ottoman Empire um, could stand on their own two feet. And the, the term Palestine, by the way, is very old. It goes back to the Roman occupation of Palestine, and it's from the Roman word for Philistia, the coastal plain. Now, that sounds like a pretty nice um, summary, but there are some problems that develop from that period, that mandate period. And the first ones that France and Britain created boundaries around all this territory. They carved out the countries. They decided where the borders would be to largely to suit their own strategic and economic interests and not without, without consulting really pretty much the local people who live there. The second thing they did, and maybe this was more practical and, and strategic, they created governments for these entities um, based on their own models. So that meant Iraq and Jordan, for example, got um, limited monarchies like Britain and Syria and Lebanon followed France's parliamentary form and they pretty much still do till today. But these Western models didn't always fit very well with the, the Arab history and culture and the style of leadership that they had experienced prior to the Turkish occupation. In fact, these two developments, the artificial boundaries and the secular governments, in part led to the long Lebanese civil war and to the 1990 invasion of Kuwait by Iraq. Finally, the last um, problematic in some ways development was um, the creation of the modern state of Israel, which was of course a very positive outcome for the world's Jews, but it was the continued, the long occupation from 1948 onward has been tragic in many ways for the Palestinian residents of this former Ottoman province and British mandate. Now you can see this is roughly what the countries look like today and you can see greater Israel in light green and the West Bank the Golan Heights and Gaza Strip are the darker green um, next to the word Israel. Now I'm going to try to do again, um, what is this, like 120 years of history or 110 years of history very quickly. Some developments after, the war, after World War I. You can see the breakdown of the population on this slide in 1918 at the end of World War I. So there already were lots of Arab Muslims and Christians and some Arab speaking Jews, probably um, mostly Arab speaking Jews in 1918. But then under the British control, the doors were opened for immigration, immigration from worlds, the world's Jews, many of whom were being pushed from country to country in Europe and were seeking a, a more permanent and safe homeland. Um, as more and more Jews emigrated, immigrated into Palestine, um, it became a little more difficult for Britain to could keep the peace because then there were um, Zionist uh, militant groups and Arab militant groups that began sparring with each other over territory. Um, and it just became really more, the, more of a headache than Britain wanted to have responsibility for. So they asked the, the newly formed UN to do a partition plan. And that plan would have given Israel 50, or the Jews, I should say, the Zionist Jews, 55% of the land and the Arabs 45% of the former Tur Turkish province. But the local Palestinian residents and their surrounding Arab neighbors didn't think that was a very fair plan. Um, and so they rejected it and a war was fought. And the, so the result of the war is that the Zionist um, forces were victorious and created the state of Israel on then 78%, not 55% of the territory. And by the way, at the time of this 47-48 um, war, 
the Christians were, the Muslims and Christians were about two thirds of the population, but they owned 94% of the land. And the Jewish population was about one third and they own 6% of the land. So that's a very quick summary that then takes us up to 1978 when there was another, um, well, I, I, sorry, I skipped 1967. In 1967 war, Israel captured the additional areas that had been governed by Egypt, the Gaza Strip, Jordan, uh, the West Bank of the Jordan River that had been under the control of Jordan, and then the Golan Heights from Syria. Um, there was a bit of good news in 1978. There was a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, and that returned the Sinai Peninsula peninsula to Egypt and some of the Golan Heights to Syria. So more, rare, more recent developments. Although there were periods of terrorist violence by Palestinian milis, militants and reprisals by the Israeli military, there have been interim peace agreements in recent years, such as the Oslo Accords, which gave the Palestinians some limited on, autonomy over the occupied West Bank. But according to the United Nations, the current percentage of the West Bank that's off limits for Palestinian use is 61%. So that's in addition to, the, to what's in greater Israel. The past initiatives have pretty much focused on a land for peace approach where there would be enough land swaps so there could be an independent Palestinian state, an independent Israeli state, and there would be peace and security for everybody and normalized relationship between Israel and its mostly hostile Arab neighbors. Until recently, they've been mostly hostile. That land for peace formula has pretty been, at least since the time of Jimmy Carter, has been the posture of the United States, and it is also the position officially of the ELCA. Now, what about Hamas? Well, Hamas arose in 1988 partly in response to the first intifada or uprising by, you may, I'm sure most of you are old enough to remember 1988 when young boys were throwing stones at Israeli soldiers, et cetera. And that was kind of the beginning of the first um, non-violent -vi uprising as opposed to non-violent resistance. Um, Hamas was formed in part as a rival to Yasser Arafat's Fatah party and the Palestinian Liberation Organization or PLO. And ironically in 1988, Israel not only tolerated but welcomed Hamas because they wanted a foil um, because they didn't like the PLO and they wanted somebody else to work with besides the PLO. More recently, a bunch of things have weakened both the Palestinian government and the Israeli government. Those include the takeover of Gaza by Hamas, wars and, and blockade between Israel and the militants in Gaza, sporadic violence by both Palestinians and Israelis, dysfunction and disunity on the Palestinian side and in, on the Israeli government side, and probably the most influential in terms of spawning the current conflict and violence is the from 1994 on, the creation and great expansion of Israeli settlements, settlements in the occupied West Bank. The, the, the settlement expansion has really been accelerated in the last 16 years under the rule of Benjamin Netanyahu. And as of this, this most recent December, there were half a million Israeli settlers in the occupied West Bank. And 200,000 more in East Jerusalem, which historically was the Jewish, uh, the Christian and Muslim part of Jerusalem. According to international law, these settlements are considered illegal because they are huge permanent cities, developments. Um, they're not temporary encampments or anything. But Israel claims that these um, territories where they built the settlements are not occupied, but disputed territory. So that's a semantic and maybe content difference there. I'm going to put a historic slide up now because it pertains to the situation we find ourselves in today, and it's a reminder of the British mandate. Right before the end of the war, the British Foreign Secretary, David Balfour, um, came up with the idea of inviting, formally inviting um, Jewish refugees, especially from Eastern Europe, to come to the to the Holy Land. He himself was what we call, to, in today's terms, a Christian Zionist, a 
maybe very right-wing conservative Christian who wants all the Jews in the world to come back to Israel because that will pave the way for the second coming of Christ. Ironically, he himself was not a lover of Jews. He was actually an anti-Semite who was very happy to have the Jews be able to move from England to the Holy Land. Um, and But look at, look at what part of the declaration said. Britain views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done to prejudice the rights of the existing non-Jewish population in Palestine. Um, and so um, many, many years later, 115 or 10 years later or whatever we are, five years later, um, we ask the question, what's left for a, a future Palestinian state? I'm going back again to the original slide to show you, of course, now the green, darker green areas, the West Bank, up up here by Syria is the Golan Heights, and then the Gaza Strip right along the Mediterranean. <clears throat> Here's a little bit of what the West Bank looks like today. There's an Israeli nonprofit organization called Betselem that monitors the freedom of movement of Palestinians around the occupied West Bank. And on this map, the white areas, for the most part, are the only areas completely under the control of the Palestinian Authority. The pink and red areas have the presence of Israeli troops, um, and there's a lot of restrictions on freedom of movement for Palestinians within those areas. And also this map um, gives you a little bit of a sense of why the people negotiating for the creation of an independent Palestinian state often refer to the West Bank as a Swiss cheese. It'll be a, a state that looks like Swiss cheese. What will happen to the settlements if there ever is a Palestinian state? Well, the, a person who's a good expert on that is an Israeli attorney named Daniel Seidemann. He's an advocate for Palestinian rights. And those of us in the ELCA have been privileged to meet him when we've taken groups to visit the Holy Land. Daniel Seidemann is one of the people had, who takes us around Jerusalem, introduces us to local leaders, et cetera. He believes that some of the settlements will need to be evacuated to make space for a Palestinian state. But of the 700 settlers in the West Bank, he thinks maybe only 200,000 would need to be relocated. Um, but it's probably probable that some of them will not be happy and will not move voluntarily. But I think any plans for this kind of a change would take into account the provision of, by the Israeli government of housing with, inside greater Israel. So people that are currently living in settlements in the West Bank would be offered an alternative place to live. At least that's the, the optimistic view. So where are the Palestinians now? Well, roughly 5 million of them are divided between greater Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank. And those breakdowns are on the screen. So you can see roughly how many there are. Um, but then there's millions around the world, and some of them are Christian, and 18,000 live in Cook County. So Cook County, Cook County has one of the highest concentrations of Palestinians per capita, I think. Um, the sort of vital center of the West Bank is the city of Ramallah. Here is a good picture of the central part of the city at night from the air. Um, and Ramallah is also the economic center. It's the political center only because the Palestinians are not allowed to have their capital in Jerusalem, which is, of course, where they would like to have their capital, just as the Israelis think of Jerusalem as their capital, but in many ways, Tel Aviv functions as the capital. Um, the best plans for peace, in my opinion, have the idea that East Jerusalem could be the Palestinian capital, West Jerusalem could be the Israeli capital, and then there would be provision made for things like the holy sites, like the Wailing Wall and the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, etc. <clears throat> now I've got a few slides just to show you what Palestine was like before the creation of the State of Israel. So this is Jerusalem in, what does it say, 1933, in the 1930s. By the way, there's these wonderful um, black and white and, and sepia slides available from the Library of Congress for anybody to use. So I was really happy to find those because usually, you know, you, you pay a premium if you get good slides from the internet, but we'll thank the Library of Congress and our tax money, I guess. Um, and I wanna say that ironically, um, when I became the coordinator of the peace effort for the ELCA in 2006, it suddenly came back to me that in the 1950s, as a little kid, 
I was visiting my grandparents. My grandfather was a professor at Augustana in Rock Island, um, our family school <laughs> where I met the all means. Um, and in the 1950s, I was probably there at the Swedish summer festival time because we were on campus at some kind of outdoor event. And I was probably 10 or something like that. And my grandparents introduced me to these twin young men who were from Jordan. But my grandmother took me aside and they were there. They were actually Lutherans from Jordan there on a scholarship in night that would have been like 1952 or 54 or something like that. They, my grandmother said, but they lost their homeland. And I had didn't think about that for like 40, 50, 40 years or something um, until I got the opportunity to try to work on this effort for the ELCA. Here's another early slide, the Romola Friends School in 1937, which is still operating today. And if you remember before, sometime before Christmas, three young men at the University of uh, Vermont in Burlington were wearing kafiyas and were shot. Those were three Muslim graduates of the Ramallah Friends School. Um, very popular school with both Christians and Muslims in, in Ramallah in the West Bank. In fact, our son went to the Quaker College, Earlham College in the early 90s, and some of his best friends were graduates of the Ramallah Friends School. And I hope some of you, well, first of all, let me just ask you, the people in, in Zoom land and the people in the room, raise your hand if you've been to the Holy Land. Good, I'm glad to see some people. Oh, yeah, I can't see the audience, but anyway, I hope some people in Zoom land have been able to be there too. So one of the reasons Lutherans are especially committed to this issue is that there is an indigenous Palestinian Lutheran church in the Holy Land. It started back in the mid-1800s when Germany sent Lutheran missionaries to build schools and orphanages and so forth. In fact, there was an, a very famous orphanage in Jerusalem called Schneller School that when Israel was created, it was moved north to the Bukha Valley of Lebanon, and it happens to be in the exact and central ancestral village of my husband, who three of whose grandparents came from that village, which we were able to visit, and we were able to visit the Schneller Orphanage founded uh, century, more than a century and a half ago, I guess. Um, so there was, it was a Lutheran mission church in Palestine until 1947 when it became an autonomous church with a local bishop. The first bishop was Daoud Haddad, and there have been local bishops ever since. The congregations are in Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Beit Jala, Beit Zahur, Ramallah, and Amman, Jordan. Besides congregations, they have ministries for the hearing impaired, youth, gender justice, and environmental education. They also sponsor four K-12 schools. The last time I checked, about 3,000 students total, many from Muslim families who want their children to be educated in an environment that pro promotes peace and unity among all the people of the Holy Land, including the Israeli Jews. And here's a bunch of teenagers that I met on one of my visits to Ramallah from Hope School in Ramallah. Now, a little bit of some facts about um, Gaza Strip. I won't read them all to you, but you can see how small it is. 25 miles long, seven miles wide, 2.3 million people. Now those 2.3 million people live in a little bit of the space at the south end of the Gaza Strip. Um, you can see it's a very high population of children, a high percentage of children. And Israel, of course, occupied Gaza in 1967 after the 67 war. But in 2005, they voluntarily withdrew and resettled the 7,000 Israelis who had were living there. The next thing that happened is that in 2006, the Palestinians in both regions, the West Bank and Gaza, had a municipal or a legislative council election. No single party got a majority of the votes, but Hamas got the plurality of the votes. So they basically took charge of Gaza. Um, and in 2007, they expelled by force the militants or the militias loyal to Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinian Authority based in Ramallah. So that left the Palestinian Authority over in control of most of the West Bank or the parts of the West Bank not controlled by Israel. And then um, the the party Hamas had control from then on um, in, the, in Gaza. 
Now, it needs to be pointed out that the vast majority of the Gazans today did not vote in the 2006 election. They were either not born yet or they were children because it's such a young population. So now here we are, do the math, um, 17 years later, I think. Um, and now Hamas is, of course, in complete control. Hamas has both a, a political and a military wing. Um, the military wing, of course, is responsible for repeated attacks on Israelis and the horrible attack of October 7th. But the political wing has been providing social services and educational services, et cetera, since, since 2005, when Israel withdrew. Despite its designation as a terrorist organization, Hamas, um, which certainly proved its terrorist stripes on, on October 7th, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu tolerated its existence because he viewed Hamas as a caretaker for all those millions of people in Gaza, and he didn't have to worry about them. Um, in, in many cases, he smoothed the way for Qatar and Iran to send huge amounts of money and weapons into Hamas and Gaza because, as I said, they were they were providing the services that Israel had had to provide until it withdrew in 2005. Um, that was not a well-known fact, the degree to which Netanyahu um, looked, completely looked the other way as Hamas was doing uh, presumably all of its tunnel building and diverting so much of that money from social services toward armaments and tunnel building. Um, that was not well known even on October 7th, um, but now the world media and especially the, the Israeli media has really exposed that complicity. And that's one of the reasons that there's so much anger inside Israel now against um, Netanyahu's leadership. And this is just a, another picture of the strip. So you can see roughly how it's populated, where urban areas are. Um, the dark, the sort of gray areas are literally refugee camps that have been there since 1948 because some of the people who live in Gaza had been in the rest of Israel and were refugees into the Gaza Strip in 1948. These camps are not tent cities. Well, now they live in tent cities in the South because of the displacement from the war, um, but they're, they're concrete you know, structures there that have been there, of course, since some of them and since 1948. One of the things that has happened um, for, for Gaza, I'm sure you know from the news, in addition to the bombardment and the destruction that that's caused, Israel cut off the water supply, destroyed the power station, and then prohibited the import of fuel to run generators, in part because, of course, that would support the war effort of Hamas. Um, there, in recent months or days, they have allowed some fuel in for hospital generators, but it's quite limited. So on one of your handouts, I put these statistics on these slides, and so you'd have them as a takeaway. And I can tell you, I check these virtually every day, and I decided on January 25th, whatever day that was, that, okay, I'm stopping now. Um, so the numbers are, are already too small, but I'm not going to read them off to you, but I please take a minute to read them yourselves, and they're on the handout too. You can see the human toll is immense on both sides, not just the side of, of the Israelis who lost 1,200 plus people on October 7th. Um, look at the number of Israelis injured, um, number of health workers killed, number of journalists killed. I think it's an all time high for the number of journalists killed and the number of days that this conflict has been happening. Um, quite a reduction in medical care, um, and some of these people listed here who are at risk because they're kidney dialysis and cancer patients were in fact, prior to October 7th and this war, able to get those treatments at the hospitals that have been destroyed. And some of them even came to the Lutheran Augusta Victoria Hospital on the Mount of Olives, uh, which by the way, is still doing medical delivery in the West Bank but some of the patients are, are Gazans who can't get home and some of the doctors are Gazans who can't get to the hospital, um, but it is still functioning. And if you've given any money to the Lutheran disaster, the ELCA's disaster relief fund, some of that money is going to keep Augusta Victoria Hospital going right now when not they aren't getting their revenue from the state of Israel 
in, in the usual amount and their doctors can't all come in. Here's a continuation of the human cost um, in more, in addition to the human lives lost, the housing units lost and all of that kind of thing. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, um, a, a really tragic issue is that the Gazans were so dependent on aid from international aid agencies that prior to this war, 500 truck, trucks a day were bringing in food and water and medicine. And you can see, I found the statistics for how many trucks got in um, in recent days, um, nowhere near 500 a day. And if you've been following the news, now you know about the scandal that some UN workers were found to be supporters of Hamas, um, 12 in particular, and the Wall Street Journal has reported that maybe as many as 10% of these UN workers who work for the UN agency, the relief agency, may have been supporters of Hamas, then the United States, the UK, and a number of countries have cut the funding, which means there will be a tiny trickle of aid trucks coming in. Um, today, uh, this morning, I think it was on Morning Edition, the foreign minister of Norway was interviewed and explained why Norway has is not cutting the funding um, because their rationale was if 12, if 12 bad apples um, deserve to be punished, maybe 2.3 million people didn't deserve to have their aid brought into the country. But you can see it's a hot potato and a political issue. One last point um, before I turn this over to Ryan. Um, when the horrible attack uh, by Hamas on the Israeli kibbutzes, the music festival, et cetera, happened on October 7. Many Palestinians, and especially Gazans, were not particularly fond of Hamas. And in fact, there was a survey done just days before the war broke out, saying that the vast majority of the Gazans were frustrated with Hamas because they knew Hamas was diverting aid money away from the things that they needed toward Hamas's own military uses or future military uses. Um, and in the past, whenever there's been an air a bombardment of Gaza, in fact, the Miller and I were there in January of 2009 during occupation or Operation Cast Lead when we could actually, from our hotel in Jerusalem, we could see the smoke coming from the bombing of Gaza. Um, in those past Israeli attacks on Gaza, ordinary citizens have gotten more favorable toward Hamas. And you can imagine what it might be like now, um, given the number, the, the death and destruction. So next, Ryan's going to talk more about the terminology we use. And we, I think um, Ruth will put in the chat and somehow it will be sent to those of you in the room, the link to watch the video that we described um, from our colleague who's a, a descendant of Palestinian immigrants. And then I'm going to, one last slide. Um, during the Q&A, um, these are some of the topics that I'd like to talk about um, that I've been researching on mainly New York Times and Haaretz. The newspaper Haaretz, I consider the New York Times of Israel, extremely helpful coverage. Um, and I've been probably spending two hours a day reading Haaretz. And so these are some of the topics that I think are important to think about for possible next steps. But we, of course, want to answer your questions too. So I will now, we'll switch computers. I, yes. There's a lot of text on some of these slides. And the reason I put that in there, I'm not going to read it all. If you're a good multitasker and a speed reader, you can read it all. But what I wanted to do was put the background here. I tried to find experts who could do this so it wasn't my opinion and where it was possible i tried to use an israeli or a jewish voice uh to do some of these things and even though there's some things that some israelis and jews wouldn't agree with i thought it's better if i use their voice than the voice of a christian with arab heritage um so this is this is sort of the background and and i just to use an example completely unrelated to this if you think about the sort of way we use words. We have the anti-abortion. People don't like that word so much because it's anti, and so they choose the word pro-life. It sounds better. And on the other side, 
We don't say pro-abortion, we say pro-choice because it sounds better. So those words have nuances to them. Uh, and if you hear them enough, you stop thinking about the nuances, but there is something behind those words. So here's uh, here are four examples of the in the media or in people's talks that I've heard them refer to the current situation. The Israeli-Hamas war, the Israeli-Gaza war, the Israeli-Palestinian war, and the Israeli-Palestine war. Now, what's what do these do? What's the difference? So the first one is Is Israel-Hamas war. The implication behind this is that the war is limited to Hamas. So don't pay attention to anything else going on. We're just after Hamas. And that's the one that's most often used. So we sometimes, I think, don't remember that there's a lot of other people dying in this thing and a lot of other people being injured besides those people fighting for Hamas. The Israel-Gaza war, the underlying implication of that one is it's limited to Gaza, but it's not. There's a lot going on in the West Bank. A lot of settlers attacking Palestinians on the West Bank and doing it with government okay. The Israel-Palestinian war, the implication of that would be that Israel's after the Palestinians. So you could see why Palestinians might say that, but Israelis wouldn't say that. And the last one, the Israeli-Palestine war, the implication is that Palestine is a separate national identity. So you can guess who would use that and who wouldn't use that. So just in the description of, of the war, you get these different things. So here are some of the words I want to talk about, I hope sort of briefly. Uh, so the first word is terrorism. We've heard a lot about the terroristic activity of Hamas on October uh, 7th. And I, I don't think anybody... Well, maybe somebody debates that, but clearly that was terroristic. But what's the real definition of terrorism, the real definition? So according to the UN General Assembly, criminal acts intended or calculated to provoke a state of terror in the general public, a group of persons or particular persons for political purposes are in any circumstances unjustifiable. We in the United States have a slightly different definition, the premeditated, politically motivated violence perpetrated against non-competent targets by subnational group or clandestine agents. Okay, the part, the back to the UN general, or no, this is part of the American definition or the US definition. It's against another nation state. Okay, so that is not, Terrorism. If it's a, a nation state against another nation state, whatever they do is not terrorism. It can be defined as terrorism. Okay. So that creates some problems. The first thing about this is that it's a very negative word. I mean, for Americans especially, that's a very negative word after 9-11. Right. So if, if people agree to use that word, we've agreed to something, a very negative label that we put on a group or a person. And once that we accept that definition, you can't really talk about anything that might explain why they did that. Any motivation. I mean, there's no acceptable motivation or inciting activities for terrorism. The other thing that I think is really important about terrorism is the definitions that we use were made up by nation states. The UN and the nations in the UN and the Americas, as I said, we have our own definition. But what that means is they left themselves out. They can't be terrorists. Nation states can't be terrorists by the definition that the UN uses for terrorism. So whatever they do, you can't use that word for them. And the other thing is this question of innocent civilians. How do we define who are innocent civilians? Second thing that we hear a lot about is who has a right to the land? And I saw this, this is from a while ago, this, this story that over on one side is the, a, a little clip of the story, but this is the part I wanted to pick out. As a young senator, Mr. Biden made Israel one of his first official trips in 1973, just before the war. Mr. Biden has told the story of meeting Golda Meir, 
repeatedly in recent days, sometimes more than once in a day, relating how she assured him about Israeli resilience by saying that Jews had a secret weapon in their struggle for Israel. Quote, we have nowhere else to go. Now, whatever she meant, I don't know, but I can guess, but what the implications of what she said were, Jews have nowhere else to go but Israel. And we know that's not true, right? There are six, 6 million Jews in Israel and five point something Jews in the United States and half a million Jews in France. I mean, they're all over the world. So that is simply not a true thing. But underlying that is the idea that this is our land, we deserve this land, and no one else can take it from us because where would we go if they take this land from us? And the other implication of it is that Palestinians have plenty of places to go. They can go to all those other Arab countries. So they should leave Israel and go there. And we, we've been hearing that in recent days, uh, that Egypt should open its borders and let the Palestinians come in and be with the other Arabs that are there in the other Arab countries. I want to point out, by the way, that Arab is not an ethnic term, a racial term, or a religious term. So it isn't really comparable to something like Jew or Israeli. Arab is about people who speak the Arabic language. That's their connection with each other, is they speak the same language. They're different. It's like Latino and Latina. They speak Spanish, so they're all Latinos. But, I mean, talk to an uh, Argentinian and a Mexican and Guatemalan. I mean, they won't agree that they're really the same people. Part of this thing about the right to the land is the phrase, for a people without a land, a land without a people. That phrase was not invented by Zionists. Well, by Jewish Zionists. It was invented by evangelical, British evangelical Christians in the 1900s. Back to that thing Carol mentioned before and that we still see is that evangelical Christians think Jesus won't come back until the Jews are back in Israel. Similarly, that phrase, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, has been misinterpreted recently as the Palestinians saying, get rid of the Jews so this will all be Palestinian. They say free, but it's been interpreted that. Now, probably there are some people who believe they should get rid of the Jews, but that is not what that phrase meant. What that meant was it started in the 1920s and 30s, and it especially grew in the 1940s when the British were coming in and saying, we're going to put the Jews, the Zionist Jews, into this land. And the Palestinians who were there were saying, let's keep it, let's don't divide it. We can live with them because we have been living with them for centuries. It was, in fact, the Muslim Arabs who invited Jews in because they were pushed out of Spain and other places in Europe. They invited them in and they got along pretty well, I think, in those years. Israeli law says any Jew from any country in the world may emigrate to Israel. But they also say that no Palestinian refugee from 1948 whose family had lived on this, that land for centuries is allowed to return to it. And in a lot of the arguments about settling peace between the Arabs and the Jews or between the Israelis and the Palestinians has been about the right of return. The Palestinians want to be able to go back to where they lived before and the Israelis say, no, you can't come back here. So that question of who has the right to the land is important. We've heard a lot of talk about this colonization, that this is colonization, and say, no, it's not colonization. The early Zionists called it colonization. So the Zionist leader, Vladimir Jabotinsky, talked about they were going to colonize the land. You have to understand when this was. This was the period of colonization. Okay, it was still colonizing. European countries were going into other countries, or they had been going into Africa and places like that, and colonizing, setting up colonies and taking over the land. 
So that's what the Zionists thought they were doing. They were coming into this land and they were gonna take it over. And what Jabotinsky is arguing here is that we're gonna to have to have an army because nobody lets you come in and take over their land. Okay. So this idea that the Palestinian Arabs should go somewhere else because they weren't here. They came from other Arab countries when the Muslims came in. And so they should go back to those other Arab countries and leave this land alone. Again, not true. I mean, they were there as long as the Jews were there. They're the Canaanites. You know, they were in that land as long as the Jews were in that land. Recently, genetic archaeologists extracted DNA from 73 individuals they found buried in Canaanite sites across what's now Israel. They took that DNA, they were still able to get it out, and they matched it with the current residents of Palestine and Israel, or the occupied territories in Israel, and there was a 53% match, not only between the current residents and those people who lived there 3,000 years ago, but between the Palestinians and the Jews. So their brothers and sisters from the same ancestors. Anti-Semitism has been a big contention in, in, in how it's used. And, and I'm, I'm not gonna spend much time on this side. This just tells about how some uh, students at Harvard uh, had their lives turned upside down because they were accused of being anti-Semitic. So here's a place where I picked a Jewish organization that's at Bard College, the uh, Nexus Task Force. And this is how they define what is not anti-Semitic. As a general rule, criticism of Zionism and Israel, opposition to Israel's policies, or nonviolent political action directed at the state of Israel and its policies should not as such be deemed anti-Semitic. Okay. It is anti-Semitic to use symbols and images that present all Jews as collectively guilty for the actions of the state of Israel. But to go after the government of Israel is not anti-Semitic. In an op-ed in um, the Harvard Crimson, which is where all that activity took place against those students, the head of the Harvard Halal, which is the Jewish student organization, uh, said, be boldly critical of Israel, not despite being Jewish, but because you are. There is no tradition more central to Judaism than prophetic truth-telling, no Jewish imper imperative more urgent than bravely criticizing corrupt leadership, starting with our own. So it isn't, I mean, the case that if you criticize Israel, you're being anti-Semitic. All right, wait a minute, wait a minute. going forward. So this is a, a, a little tape, I, a piece of video I found from Shulamit Aloni, who was an Israel, she's dead now, but she was an Israeli politician. She won the Israel Prize. She was a minister in the government. And she was interviewed about the question of anti-Semitism. Well, anti-Semitic. Uh, what is your response to that as an Israeli Jew? Well, it's a trick. We always use it. When from Europe somebody is criticizing Israel, then we bring up the Holocaust. When in this country people are criticizing Israel, then they are anti-Semitic. And the organization is strong and has a lot of money. And the, the ties between uh, Israel and the American esta Jewish establishment are very strong. And they are strong in this country. As you know, uh, they have power, which... It's okay, they are talented people and they have power, money and uh, media and other things. And their attitude is Israel, my country, right or wrong. Yeah, I won't play the rest of it, but basically it's, just, it's, a, it's a way of shutting down discussion. So the next thing is collective punishment. This is an issue that has come up. Um, so do I need to turn off the sound on this now? No, okay. Uh, so... Uh, international law posits that no person may be punished for acts that he or she did not commit. So this is about because the Hamas did this, we can punish lots of people for doing uh, what they did, that, that they somehow are responsible for what went on. Um, and the International Red Cross 
points out that collective punishment is used as a as a tool when there are occupying powers in a country uh, and they want to keep the population down. It's a way of keeping them under control by knowing that, you know, your neighbor could be punished if you say something or your son or daughter could be punished if you say something. So that is collective punishment. If you go after people who didn't do the thing, but are part of the group that did the thing. Then there's the thing about hostages and prisoners. And, and I this was on the news this morning. Uh, CNN was on, we were at the gym this morning and they were talking about the uh, agreement that they're working on uh, to end the war. And it said that one hostage of Hamas would be released for every three Palestinian prisoners. Okay, so it's an interesting vocabulary. So a hostage is somebody who is taken prisoner to get somebody else to do something. Okay, and that is exactly what Hamas is doing. Okay, they took hostages so they could get the government to do something. That is also what people say the Israeli government does. There are thousands of Palestinians in prison without trial, without charges. They just held in prison, sometimes for years without having this. this since 1967, the estimate is five, five, 50. 5,000 of them are in prison. So in, in, in real terms, and here I'm quoting this Mansef Kahana, who worked for the United Nations, who's arguing that those people really are hostages too, because what the Israeli government is trying to do is get the Palestinians to behave themselves. And the way they do that is say, this is, this is what will happen to you if you don't behave yourself. So they are taking people to try to accomplish something. So properly, they are hostages as well. I think this is the last set of words, explanation versus justification. So um, I put in this thing here, this is from a thing I found on bullying in schools, totally unrelated, but this talks about why kids bully other kids. And what they point out is that if you know why they bully other kids, you have a better chance of stopping it. And then there's this thing about why do serial killers kill that the FBI put out, okay? What I put these in here for is to, to make the distinction. These are explanations for this. These do not say it's okay to bully other kids. It's okay to be a serial killer. So you can explain something without justifying it. And people have tried to explain why Hamas attacked Israel, okay? So there is an accepted explanation. This is my take on this. This is the accepted uh, explanation for why they did it. The reason they did it was because they want to stop the U.S. and Saudi Arabia and Israel from making an agreement. And so if they cause a lot of trouble, the Saudis will pull out and there won't be any agreement going on. I mean, that could have been the reason. And that's the accepted reason. The ex unaccepted reason and this comes from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, part of the explanation may be that what Hamas saw as its gestures toward moderation before October 7 attacks brought it few rewards. It rebranded itself in 2017, getting rid of the charter that said they wanted to wipe out the Israelis and get rid of them and said they were willing to accept a two-state solution. They made economic concessions, you know, and there, but at the same time, it says there was incendiary far right political rhetoric and rising levels of violence against, against Palestinians. So maybe that's an explanation, again, without being a justification. Here's another little uh, video that I, I keep on thinking if one attack, as barbaric as it was, and it was barbaric, mm -hmm. if one attack, pushes so many Israelis to become inhuman. There's no other word but inhuman. Imagine yourself what it does to Palestinians who live under those attacks for decades. And we always wonder how come they hate us and how come they became those monsters and how come they are so violent and how come they, 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 they are not human. Here is the answer. 
And the last thing is um, Israel has no partner for peace. Um, and, and I think Carol uh, referred a little bit to it uh, before, but I just want to play another little video here. This is uh, Brzezinski, whom you many of you will recognize. You and I both know Bill Clinton gave Arafat and the Palestinians everything. You know, you have sort of such a stunningly superficial knowledge of what went on that it's almost embarrassing to listen to you. Oh, is it? If you were to look more closely at what happened, in the Clinton uh, Camp David discussions, you would know that we have just said it's absolutely wrong. There were all sorts of provisions and catches to the so called proposal, and it wasn't rejected. The negotiations went on in Taba, and then there were elections in Israel, and Sharon came in, and everything got aborted. I should... We have another block, and I'm very excited about that because. I'm stunningly superficial. Chief, I look forward to you educating me. Okay, that's enough. But it, it does. Okay. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about, I'd say from the, the uh, words, is this idea that you, if you look at things in context rather than to think of them as unique, it might be helpful. So the first thing I want you to think about is think about what's happening in, in Palestine and Israel right now and compare it to what happened to indigenous Americans when the European settlers came in. Um, they took over their land. They killed many of them. And then when they fought back, they called them savages and took over their land completely. So it, it say, oh, we've seen this before. I mean, this is colonialism. This is how it works. Um, the other thing I'd like you to think about is, so some of the things that are happening now are not as bad as things that happened in other wars. They're not as bad as Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At least I don't think so. Okay. But something is different now, and that is the Geneva Conventions. After World War II, people looked at it and said, we cannot do this again. We human beings cannot treat each other like this again. And so we built these conventions that say, these are things you cannot do. And that's where the arguments about genocide and collective punishment and those things came from. The Geneva Conventions as an attempt to stop us from going back to that. So when people say, well, you did it too, or well, it was done in World War II, so it's not that bad. Okay, it's different. It's supposed to be a different time. We're supposed to be moving forward. This idea of you know killing, they've now killed lots of Palestinians and is, uh, Israeli uh, hostage, Hamas hostages who were carrying white flags. I think that we look at that and it should tell us something about what is, is going on. Uh, and the idea that Hamas is hiding behind innocent civilians. I mean, they are definitely mixed in. That's, that's not an argument, I don't think. They're there, they're with the Palestinians. But I ask people to think about, you know, so you're watching this movie or TV show where there's police, one of, there's lots of police shows, you know, and there's a, a guy who's a murderer, let's say, or a, a bank robber. And in order to, the police are after him and he's, he goes into this house and he grabs a little kid and holds a little kid in front of him, okay? If in that show, the police shot through the little kid into the guy who robbed the bank, you would say, what the heck is going on? You can't do that. So even though people are hiding behind somebody else, it's not okay to kill those people. but somehow we're getting the argument that it is okay. Thank you. Okay, all right. You saw the human cost slides and they're on the handout. And Ruth, are the handouts in the chat? The, the handouts are here, we'll get them in the chat. Okay, yes. okay, good. All right, um, just so you can have the human cost as a takeaway. Um, I want to underscore that because I read Haaretz probably two hours a day, I know that life for Israelis these days is also very traumatic. They, are, they have continuing airstrikes from, from Hamas into greater Israel, into Israeli towns. Kids are having to spend the night um, in bomb shelters in many places. Thousands of Israelis have been displaced from the areas that are close to the borders with Gaza. Um, and also, of course, we still have at least 136 hostages being held by Hamas, and their fate is connected 
to the growing anger that we see in Israel against the Netanyahu regime um, for the uh, failure to deal with the hostages in a way that um, will perhaps re release release them and you know and save their lives. There's also a risk at, that we're seeing much more just in the last week of escalation to the whole region, and I'm sure you're aware of that. And that risk also greatly endangers U.S. interests and now is U.S. personnel. We have the Yemeni Houthis um, attacking merchant ships, and I can talk about that if you need to, Or and we have Iranian-backed militias, um, not so much inside Iran, but in, in, in Iran, but in places like Syria and Iraq, attacking military bases, as we saw with the tower attack that killed three of our um, troops in Jordan just in the last few days. This escalation, by the way, is playing right into the hands of Iran and its ally, Russia. Why do they want this escalation? Because they don't want normalized relations between Israel and its Arab neighbors. They want to distract from dissension inside Iran, coming especially from younger people and women inside Iran, and they want to weaken the U.S. commitment to Ukraine. Um, so there's the, the whole situation could easily escalate. So that was my introduction about why this is so urgent, and now um, we'll be happy to take questions from the room, and I think Ruth can monitor questions from the chat. Bishop Miller. This, I think this may be more of an observation, but it came to me, Ryan, when we were talking about the analogy shooting through a hostage in a bank robbery, police shooting through a hostage to kill the perpetrator of the robbery. Right. And what came to me was that the, the, this whole frame, we're talking about language, the whole frame changes. If you see this in the language, in the imagery of law enforcement, as opposed to war Right? The rules of engagement for law enforcement are fundamentally different from the rules of engagement for, for war, and it has to do with the, the acknowledged sovereignty of the warring parties, and so there's a different set of rules for that. And, and I'm not sure what we do about this other than in our own language. Is it, you made this a question, would it be useful for us to start to think about this in the imagery and the language of how do you manage law enforcement when a criminal act has happened on a major scale on October 7th? And does that change the way you respond to it and approach it? And might it change our way of thinking about it? I think that's a really good observation. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for your mind. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Are we so, taking the mic over? Yeah, yeah, we were supposed to take the mic over. Bishop Miller, for those of you on Zoom, asked the question um, that if we think about this as not so much a war between two nation states, which it's not, but a, a, a law and order situation where a crime, a horrible crime was committed on, on, on October 7th, and now there's a response um, coming from the nation state of Israel. And would it be more helpful to think about it as a law enforcement issue. I have a comment, and I'm sure you have a comment. Too. Well, I was just going to say, it, 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 it's very intimate. It makes me think of something like what goes on in Chicago, uh, and how we criticize the police when they overreact, and they, we say, it's not helping. It's getting worse. You're not doing anything that's helping when you beat somebody up and strangle them, and you have a George Floyd. Um, you only make things worse. So I, it would be interesting. I mean, I understand when a lot of people get killed and there are stories about how terribly they were killed and i'm not sure many of them were true but still they were there people are very angry and they want revenge so i understand they would react that way but i think that's a good observation they could probably do a lot more good by more selectively taking care of of what's going on and not only that, and Israeli human rights groups have pointed out that this isn't a war between two nation states. It's a war between a militant group in occupied territory. So in terms of international law, Israel has maybe an extra responsibility to perfect, protect the civilians of Gaza. So your analogy is really helpful in that regard too, I think. Anyone else in the room have a question and then we'll go to the Zoom. Thank you, maybe I have one so it's good, 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 good. Um, so if the, if the Palestinian occupied territories are part of Israel, 
Why do they have their own separate program and separate counseling? They really, they don't really have a separate military. They have police forces, but that was part of the agreements that, first of all, when the, um, after the 67 war, it was under pretty much complete Israeli control, the, the occupied West Bank. But with the Oslo Accords in 1993, then Israel gave back to the Palestinian Authority um, the, the right to control some of the areas like Ramallah and and that map I showed you, the white areas, but the pink and the red areas were really not given back to them. So, um, and they have they have a they have a government to to supervise that territory, but it that hasn't made it an independent nation state. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Are there any questions on the Zoom group? Yes. Um, one of the questions is here. Um, The U.S. Congress passed a resolution declaring that, quote, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, end quote. Is there a claim in any sense historically true? Okay, is anti-Zionism the same as anti-Semitism? That's hotly debated by pretty much all of my Jewish friends. <laughs> um, and there's, you can find Jews that are on both sides of that, that you must be Zionist to be a good Jew, um, and you may also oppose the Zionist project and be a faithful Jew. That's my quick answer to it. You want to say any more? Yeah, that is, I mean, that people can put those two things together to try to confuse the issue a lot about whether you could criticize. But one of the in doing some research for this, one of the things that surprised me is how many. Um, Orthodox, I don't know, I don't know all the divisions of Judaism, but the very Orthodox Jews are against Zionism um, because they say they the way they read the Hebrew Bible. I mean, I think I'm right on, on describing this way. God said, you don't get to come back here. You guys were bad and you don't get to come back. And so they don't think there should be a, a new Zionist movement and a state in Israel for Jews, and they are opposed to it. So there is disagreement about uh, whether you can be a, if you're anti-Semitic, if you say you're anti-Zionist. Okay. Okay. If it is true that I read, it says Hamas is charged with all the extermination of all the people, how is it possible to negotiate peace? That's a super great question. And Ryan referred to the fact that they revived their charter in 2017. What they they renounced, they renounced that part of it to destroy Jewish people, but said they that they would tolerate Jews living in the Holy Land if there would be an independent Palestinian state. The part the Hamas re revised charter kind of fudged was whether that Jewish population could be also an independent state. So they left that intentionally fuzzy, I think. Um, and so to say that Hamas favors a quote two state solution is a, a, a misunderstanding or an exaggeration of what they promised. But they renounced or they took out the part about destroying Jewish people but did not go so far as to say, we're happy with a, two states living side by side. Does that make sense? I think that's how the revision played out. I wanna quickly just call your attention on the handouts. Um, those of you at home, there's one called Holy Land Crisis Links. And I um, have worked on this for three months now and I keep adding and subtracting, but I tried to have really a lot of representation um, on both the Palestinian side, the American side, the, the Israeli side, there's a lot of diversity in, in Israel and among American Jews, um, but I put asterisk by some of the most helpful things. And if you wanna look at a website that is run by both um, Arabs and Jews, um, it's under the list periodicals and newsletters, S. Daniel Abraham Center for Middle East Peace, 
recommended by one of the ELCA leaders who most follows this issue, Dennis Fredo, um, who ran the World Office for uh, World Community, Lutheran Office for World Community at the UN. That they have a page, um, um, the S. Daniel Abraham Center, it's under periodicals and newsletters. They have a page that spells out what are all the sticky with the issues that have to be solved for there to be a, a safe, secure Israel and a independent Palestinian state. And so I really recommend that website. Um, I um, recommend, you know, all a, a ton of the stuff that's on here. Um, but I also wanted to call your attention to two articles that, are you putting the articles in yes. the chat? Yes. Okay, there's copies of the two articles. And these are just to give you an example of really comprehensive coverage. One article is from the New York Times in December, a heartbreaking story about peacemakers in Israel and Palestine who've been working together for like 20, 30 years in this group called Parent Circle Family Forum, which Bishop Miller, I think, has heard speak. I have heard them speak in Jerusalem. They are, it is a combination of family members who on both sides, Israel and Palestinians, who have lost close family members to this conflict and have pledged to become friends and allies to promote peace. And after October 7th, they could hardly talk to each other. It's just a heartbreaking article, but it really is worth reading as kind of a microcosm for why it's so hard to talk about these things. And then the other article is by um, an Israeli journalist for Haaretz who talks about blind spots that we need to get over, such as, you know, we have a dehumanized view of the other, which is such a huge problem in this conflict. And we also have blind spots. And Ryan mentioned the one, there's no partner for peace. And this Israeli journalist takes that on and said, we'll never make peace if we don't get rid of these blind spots. Um, I had hoped to talk to you about <laughs> the next steps. I will just, um, I will take a few minutes just to say, is there any hope? I think for peace, maybe because we don't have time to go over the next steps that I um, wa want to talk about more completely. And I would say what feels really hopeless right now is of course the ongoing destruction, fear, death, lack of medical care, hunger, et cetera. New polling of both the Israeli and the Palestinian populations show that they have gotten more extreme since October 7th. Israelis for obvious reasons, Gazans for obvious reasons. And so before October 7th, it was thought that at least a majority of both populations favored two states side by side. Now that's in question because of this. And American voters, as we know, are polarized in new ways and we have an election on the horizon. What feels hopeful to me is from all the reading I've been doing is that there are Israeli and Palestinians who continue to work together for peace. And I've put some of those peace groups on the links handout. Um, there we've seen a lot of really helpful advocacy from our own ELCA Washington office and from Churches for Middle P East Peace, which is an organization of about 30 denominations and Catholic orders. And the ELCA is one of the main leaders of that organization. They lobby people in Congress and the White House directly to try to promote peace. Also, I think just being able to talk with my Palestinian and Jewish friends has been really helpful. So when you've got this, all these ashes and deaths, is there any hope that there could be a good outcome? Well, I want to end by quoting a Haaretz writer, one of the senior correspondents for Haaretz is named Anshel Pfeffer, I think is how you pronounce his name. He reminds us that only six years after the 1973 Yom Kippur War, Egypt's Anwar Sadat came to Jerusalem and signed the Camp David Agreement. He also reminds us that the Oslo Accords in 1973 happened um, and no one ever expected Yasser Arafat and, and Itzhak Rabin to do that back in 1993. Um, and so he said it's going to be an uphill battle because when two nations have conflicting narratives and claims, it's harder to make a, pro a prag pragmatic compromise. But I will tell you in um, the New York Times and Haaretz the last two days, there's a lot of evidence that American and Israeli and Arab officials are working in three tracks to end the war. Um, and you know, there's like 
Right now, negotiations for what kind of ceasefire would allow a hostage and prisoner exchange to finalize the post-war status of Gaza and then to set up a path toward a Palestinian state. And there's probably because of this horrific series of events, the world attention is now focused on that issue again that we were trying so hard back when I worked at the ELCA to bring people's attention. So it's terrible that it had to come to the forefront in the way it has, but I think that at least is a hopeful sign. Last thing you want to say? Oh, nope. time's up. Okay. <laughs> I told people to be, okay. we can get that slide to them when we get the recording. Well, it's on, it's on the handout, the, the list of next steps. Okay. It's there, yeah. We don't have so give us one. Give, give you one. Oh, wow. Wow, wow, one. Well, I've, I've talked on a few of them. Um, I can tell you that 80% of the Israeli population believes that there won't be peace with Benjamin Netanyahu in charge of a government. So there have been a number of articles about how can the Knesset call for new elections? What are the mechanisms that would bring that about? Um, and the vast majority of editorials that you've seen, like from Tom Friedman and, the, and actually the New York Times and Haaretz are saying that th there will be no permanent peace and safety for people in Israel without the creation of a Palestinian state. There are two other proposals on the table. Some people want like the idea of once a binational state where everybody is in under one government, that is highly unlikely ever to happen because currently it's almost 50-50, the number of Arabs, Christians and Muslims and Israeli Jews. But in maybe 10, 20 years, there, the Arabs will outnumber the Jews, and then it would no longer be a Jewish state. It would no longer have, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be in control, I guess you could say, of their own destiny. A third proposal, besides the two states, is a confederation. And there's, there's links that you could put, I gave you that in the links to put in the chat. There's a whole organization of American and Israeli Jews and Palestinians working together, proposing a confederation model where there will be two states, but like the United States, it will be a confederation with a, a legislative body of 300 people elected from the two countries. And that body, in order to pass any legislation, would require 55% of each group. So 55% of Israelis and 55% of the Palestinians would have to approve legislation. Um, and that would be a way to be, be a binational state, but with autonomy, um, so that, that Israel could remain predominantly Jewish and the Palestinians predominantly Arab. So th those are some things that are down, coming down the horizon. And I guess, um, let me sort of look at my, look at my, my list of, of next steps, which now I can't find. Just a second. Yeah, one, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Um, there's, there is one leader from Hamas, and there's, uh, it's quite controversial in the Israeli defense in industry or uh, the war cabinet, whether they should try to assassinate him or not. Um, there have been some attempts, but a more important question, I think, is to ask who could lead the Palestinians. And, and part of one of my next steps was both, both of those entities, Israel and the Palestinians, need a regime change. And so the vast majority of Israelis want someone other than Netanyahu, who has, was already to the right, and he's gone much farther to the right in terms of building Israeli settlements and not talking about a possible Palestinian autonomy. And then there's also the fact that <clears throat> the Palestinians have an uh, octogenarian president. That, that sounds a little familiar, um, <laughs> Mahmoud Abbas. And he's very, very unpopular. The PA in Ramallah has, is considered inefficient, ineffective, and corrupt. And both Palestinians and some Israelis, including the head of Shin Beit, the security ser services, believe Marwan Barghouti, who's in prison by Israel, is the best hope to be released in this next exchange because he's the most popular Palestinian leader, and he potentially could be a new leader for a reconfigured Palestinian authority. So among the proposals to, to go forward to a permanent peace with a Palestinian state is to 
reinvigorate the Palestinian Authority. And there's a bunch of suggestions of how to do that. For example, get expatriate Palestinian business people to come back into the West Bank, set up businesses to invigorate the economy, and have someone who's more respected by the Palestinian people in, in control. And even the suggestion, and this has come from the chief um, Jewish pro-peace lobbying group in Washington is named J Street, and they're proposing that a, a combination of European and Arab nations would do a security force along with the Palestinian Authority to kind of control Gaza, keep order um, to avoid a reoccupation by Israel, which is what, of course, Netanyahu wants to do is completely reoccupy Gaza and move out the, the Palestinian um, Gazans who, who live there. So there's lots of ways that hopefully the Palestinian leadership can be improved. Okay, I think I better quit. <laughs> I'm sorry. We, we have, as Ryan said, we, we have been spending far too much time reading about this, but obviously we're very passionate that some good end can come. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.